This morning, uh, well, for those of you who this is your first time, my name is Marissa Copeland, and I am the associate pastor here at Trinity. And it's a joy that to have you here, and especially our friends who are online. If you were here with us last week, you heard um, Steve read a passage from Romans chapter 12. And you're going to hear that passage again this morning because it is one that we are carrying through our sermon series we are calling Genuine Love. So hear these words again from Romans chapter 12 verses 9 through 18. And please follow along on the screens. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, but be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Pursue hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be arrogant, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible... So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This is the word of God offered to us as a gift because we are all the children of God. So in response to this gift, we say together, thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? O God of continual revelation, May the words we say be words that carry the weight of meaning from our hearts to yours. May the words we hear this morning convey the response that we need to hear from you. By your Holy Spirit, open our ears and make ready our hearts. Amen. Let love be genuine. Immediately above this verse in the New Revised Standard Translation of the Bible, the editors thought it fitting to give this section of Paul's letter to the Romans a title, Marks of a True Christian. Because for Paul, what it means to be a Christian or a Christ follower is to live a life of faith that mirrors the God who loved us first. We are genuinely loved. Therefore, we are called to love others in response. As Pastor Steve reminded us last week, this list of examples that Paul offers us in this passage of what genuine love might look like in action are big asks. This task of loving genuinely, being patient when you've had it up to here, Offering blessing when you think the other, what the other person really needs to hear are some choice words. Living in harmony with people who make you angry or uncomfortable or downright frustrated. This kind of love is hard. This kind of love takes practice. And we as Christians who are also Methodists, believe that this kind of love is cultivated over time as part of what we call sanctification, a long word that means this ongoing journey of faith by which we are transformed by the grace of God as we participate in spiritual disciplines. These disciplines guide and support us on our journey of faith, almost like scaffolding on the side of a building that is being restored. Spiritual disciplines help facilitate the reshaping work of the Holy Spirit. 
Over the next several weeks, we will t- be talking about different spiritual disciplines that help us cultivate a life of genuine love that we have been called to. This morning, we are pondering together the gift and experience of worship. What is worship? And how might it shape who we are as a community of faith? I believe these very questions were at the heart of Paul's letter to the Romans. You see, when he penned this letter, the church in Rome had already been established for years. So we can imagine that the life of the Christian community found in Rome was already set in a certain routine. Maybe on Monday, the community gathered at Martha's house for dinner. On Wednesday, maybe they shared uh, gospel stories around a campfire, stories that they heard from generation to generation passed down. And on Sunday, their worship was already set in stone. They listened to scripture and they sang old songs together and they gathered in one place. As a bustling and diverse metropolitan area of around one million people coming and going, we can also imagine that life in Rome was fast-paced and ever-changing. And I wonder if it was easy for the Christians who were in Rome to sort of get lost in the shuffle of their everyday life, just like it, must, it might be for us as well. So maybe... Just maybe, worship and gathering together as a community of faith became lost for the Romans to the way it has to be or has always been. Or turned into an item to check off of their weekly to-do list. Or maybe it's slowly downgraded and important compared to all of the other things that were rushing around in their life. I wonder if worship lost a little bit of its mountaintop luster. And if we're honest with ourselves, maybe the true power and meaning of what worship is has been lost for us too. It's easy for us to get locked into the dailiness of our routines of our everyday life. To walk through these doors of this worship center, still adding things to our shopping lists, or our cleaning lists, or our honey-do lists. It's easy for us to have worship simply be this performance we get to observe and watch, rather than being an active participant in the experience of the Holy Spirit around us. So maybe, just maybe, in our quest to reorient our lives toward genuine love, we, like the Romans, need to be reminded of the heart of worship. On this journey to discovering or rediscovering the heart of worship, I believe we first need to uncover what we actually think worship is. So in the spirit of participatory worship, I'm going to ask you a question that I would love to hear your out loud responses to. But I'm going to give you a few moments to get ready uh, for it. So prepare your hearts to share uh, your responses. And if you're joining us online, I invite you to put your responses in the comment section so you're joining in this with us. Are you ready for the question? In one or two words, what is worship for you? Fellowship. Praising God. Joy. Peace. Community. Showing God his worth. Oh, I like that. What else is worship for you? Prayer. Music. All of these answers are right. Good job, friends. 
All of these are parts of worship. What we have come to know and to expect out of worship is an experience that is both individual and shared in community. From welcome home to go in peace. Those of us who are leading worship are actually called to facilitate an ongoing conversation between revelation and response. Where we believe that God is speaking to us. And we in turn, both collectively and individually, are invited to respond. Milburn Price, Price, more fondly known to us as Steve Price's dad, uh, while he was the dean at the School of Performing Arts at Samford University, co-authored a book called The Dialogue of Worship. It's a beautiful book, and in it, he describes worship in this way. The conversation began for each believer when he or she first became aware of the prompting of God's Spirit, preparing heart and mind to hear and receive the Word of God. When that hearing and receiving led to an expression of faith in Jesus Christ and a commitment to Jesus as Lord of life, the lifelong pattern of hearing and responding to the word of God was established. Worship is so much more than the words that we say or the songs that we sing. It's a continuation of a conversation that God started long before any of us stepped through the doors of this worship space this morning. And one that will continue long after we exit to this building as well. So if at its core, worship is this ongoing conversation, I think it's important to consider more than just our own understanding of what worship is. Maybe we should also ponder together what God, as the other conversation partner, might think worship is. While I can't presume that any of us actually know what God might think, I believe that Paul's letter to the Romans provides a good framework to help us conceptualize God's perspective of this conversation. Just a few verses before the passage we read at just a few moments ago, Paul says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, on the basis of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. That's an odd pairing of words, reasonable act of worship. The word that's translated as reasonable here is the Greek word logikin. In other places, you might see it translated as spiritual, which seems to fit. But Greek scholars actually believe that it would be more properly translated as divinely reasonable. Or maybe, what is logical to God? So if this were the case, then what Paul is expressing to the Romans and to us this morning is that worship that is most logical to God is when we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice. He is suggesting that God doesn't care about the performance of worship, It isn't all about having the right words or clapping at the right time or standing up or sitting down. Maybe it isn't entirely about what's going on right here at this very moment. Instead, worship that is pleasing and logical to God looks more like this. A long time ago, In the town of Capernaum, Jesus was invited by a Pharisee to his house for dinner. 
And so Jesus went and gathered with other Pharisees who were invited, and he sat down to enjoy a meal with them. When a woman who was uninvited comes in. Now this woman was not dressed for the occasion. She didn't look like she belonged with anyone else. Her robes were a bit worn and dirty, maybe from a long walk on a dirt path from across town. Maybe her hair wasn't pinned up just right and knotted because she wasn't able to brush or pull a comb through it in order to prepare for this moment. But she heard that Jesus was just around the corner. And how could she not? How could she not go see this person who has changed her life? And so she goes into this house where she was uninvited and maybe even unwanted. She locks eyes with Jesus as other eyes are looking upon her. And she makes her way to him. Maybe pulling out as she is walking a small jar of her most expensive perfume. Maybe it was her most expensive item that she owned. So she walks to Jesus bends down before his dirty feet. With tears on her face, she pours her beautiful perfume and trickles her tears like rain. Realizing that she forgot a towel, she bends even further to allow her hair to be what dries Jesus's feet. Present your bodies as a holy and living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your reasonable act of worship. According to the world standards, she had nothing to offer Jesus, but she had her bravery to offer Her willingness to enter into a place she knew she was not welcome. She knew she did not belong. She had her trust in the difference that Jesus had already made in her life. She had her most expensive possession. Perfume she was saving for a pivotal moment. And she had her very life spilled in tears upon the feet of the one who would also give his life. This is what God desires for us. What God longs for and craves from us. Worship isn't all about what we do. Rather, it's about the posture of our heart. So this morning, we too are invited to offer ourselves. Maybe we offer our time, uninterrupted by the dailiness of the lives that we lead out there. We offer our bravery in setting the masks that we hold up for the world to see. So that our pain and our heartbreak and our loneliness and our suffering as not laid bare for all to see. We offer our trust in this community and in the power of the Holy Spirit to hold us and to welcome us. And we offer up the things that we hold tightest so that nothing, not death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, not anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love, the genuine love that God already has for us. This morning, 
we are, offer, are invited to offer up our very lives as our ongoing song of praise. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> when the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into our heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. Because it's all about you. It's all.